Okay, so we're now going to start the unit on chemical equations, and this starts with balancing chemical equations. So a chemical reaction can be described in three ways. First is a word equation. That's our English words, and um, that's what naming was all about, was taking English words and turning them into the language of chemistry, which is with the chemical formulas. Next is a skeletal equation, which is also not adequate enough because we need to balance that equation in order to correctly represent a chemical reaction. We're going to remind ourselves real quick what we learned yesterday. You should have watched the video on diatomic elements. And there's a couple different ways to remember diatomic elements. You can either think of them as the genine molecules. All the elements on the periodic table of the elements that end in G-E-N or I-N-E are called diatomic elements or molecular elements, meaning that they don't come by themselves. The other one is Brinkelhoff. I never remember Brinkelhoff, so that's not one that works well for me. I'm more of like a visual learner, so I like the high seven. Let's look at the different parts of the chemical equation. So the coefficients are the numbers that are written in front of the compound or element. Those multiply everything behind them until you get to a plus or an arrow. So the coefficients are going to have a compound behind them that's either going to be a molecule. Molecules are covalently bonded. Those are ones that don't include metals. Formula units are ones which are ionically bonded and they have a metal in the first position. Atoms, ions, or moles. So notice when you have a one, just like we did with subscripts, when the subscript was one, we didn't really have to write the one. The same thing goes for the coefficients. On the left-hand side of that yield sign are the reactants. On the right-hand side are always the products. That yield sign in the middle, the arrow, means produces. That suggests some sort of action. So the reactants are what we start with before anything ever happens. The products are what we end with after the yield sign. You can think of that yield sign as an equal sign. The atoms on the reactant side have to equal the same number and kind of atoms on the product side. Afterwards, you're going to have states of matter. Obviously, G is for gas, L is for liquid, S is for solid, which is the same as a precipitate. AQ might be new to us. That means dissolved in water. So anytime you see AQ, it is typically a compound that is dissolved in water or an ionic compound more specifically. So according to the law of conservation of matter, atoms cannot be created nor destroyed. Anton Lavoisier was considered the father of modern chemistry. He was actually a pretty dynamic man. Um, he was in charge of lots of different aspects, but he also had his fingers in lots of different things. So, and he also married a woman who was considered to be, um, I don't know, semi-royalty, I guess I'd say. And then, um, this was back then when scientists were kind of like rock stars, you know. So, it's a little bit different these days. We know more about actors and actresses than we do about our scientists in this world. And we can name more Kardashians than we can name scientists. Can anybody name a current scientist? Somebody who's alive today? You got one? Um, well, 
I don't know if he would really count since he is kind of a personality, but he's also a scientist, so like no Degrom Tyson. I'll give you that. That's absolutely true. Yes. He's more of an engineer, but still Captain Johnson. Absolutely. Engineers? Yes. Bill Nye. Bill Nye. Okay. We'll give you Bill Nye. How's that sign? He's really likes his science, right? Yes. <laughs> there you go. See? Good answer. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, back then, it was kind of like the scientists. Those were the guys that everybody was like, oh, what's he doing today type of thing. But unfortunately, because he was part of, um, you know, a little bit more like the royal class, then the French Revolution hit, blah, 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 blah. Things didn't go so well for him. So he was beheaded by the guillotine and um, went the way of a lot of other scientists in um, history have been executed for being scientists. I think he was more executed because he was a, a tax collector at some point in time. That's probably where he came from. And he was married to um, a rich woman. So, um, all, a lot of those guys, it's not even written down in history. A lot of those guys were executed. Galileo was forced to renounce all of his um, discoveries in science. So there's a famous quote by him. We don't know if that's really true. When they say people said things a long time ago, we really don't know that's true, right? But he was uh, heard to whisper, but it does move because the um, Catholic Church made him renounce his belief that the earth revolved around the sun because we know the earth has to be the center of the universe, right? Anyway, we digress. Okay, so law of conservation of matter states that whatever goes in on the reactant side must come out on the product side. So we need to have balanced chemical equation to account for all of the atoms that go into the reaction to make sure they all come out and are accounted for on the other side of the reaction. We use coefficients on that. So turn in your looks, let's go down to your notes. Let's highlight a few things because these are the ones that are gonna be particularly helpful for you in the hints on balancing. So we're gonna start where you're just gonna be given the chemical formulas already, but we don't wanna lose our ability to name compounds. That's the biggest thing that I see when I have AP chemistry students coming in, they don't remember how to name compounds. So I try to keep that fresh in your brain now that you've learned it, <clears throat> to make sure that we don't lose that skill. So first we have to make sure all formulas are written correctly. Only alter the coefficients while balancing. So you're never going to change the subscripts when you're balancing a, a chemical equation. I'm going to show you what that means, and I'm going to tell you the things, the mistakes I'm going to see you make and have you try to resist the urge. So think of the yield sign as an equal sign separating the reactants from the products. And then I usually begin with the largest or most complex compound. Sometimes you're going to run across a chemical equation that doesn't need any coefficients and you're going to write balanced. That's fine too. And the coefficients must be in the lowest terms. So if you go through and balance something and you get coefficients of 2, 4, 2, 2, you have to reduce that down to one, two, one, one. Here are some other additional hints. Leave hydrogen and oxygen for last. So put a little highlight that one or put a star by it or something like that. That's gonna help you. And the reason is, is that oxygen is in the air around us. It's all over the place. Thank goodness, because you never have to walk into my room and say, I hope Miss Boston has enough oxygen. Always all over the place in every square inch of the surface of the earth. That's why oxygen's in so many compounds. Sometimes you might have to think of water instead of as H2O as HOH. And that's mostly when you're dealing with polyatomic ions. 
Here's another one that I want you to put a star or highlight. If an atom's present on one side of the equation as an odd quantity and present on the other side of the equation as an even quantity, try doubling the odd value. That's going to be one strategy that gets you out of situations where you get confused. Some equations or compounds have an element present in more than one compound or part of the compound. You have to be careful of that. Like I said, oxygen's all over the place. So you have to be, did I count all of the oxygens? So sometimes an element is in multiple compounds, and that can be confusing. And then, of course, our diatomics. Here's how you spell Brinkelhoff, if that works for you. If you're more of a word person, I'm more of a visual person. So looking at the periodic table, the elements, it's help, more helpful for me there with the high seven. But if you're more of a word person, maybe Brinkelhoff or Janine would work better for you to remember those seven, seven elements. All right, we're going to practice counting atoms together. This is what we call the T-chart method. So I made you a little T-chart. So you don't have to do a T-chart with every single one, but you can do a T-chart with every single one. So how we count these is look at aluminum bromide. So what I do is I list all of the elements that are present in a chemical reaction first. And then I count them. The coefficient in front, look at aluminum bromide, means that I have two aluminums, but then I have two times three bromines. You have to account for that. So I have two aluminums on each side. Notice how the subscript multiplies the number that you have, and so does the coefficient. I have six bromines on both sides, too. Let's take a look at potassium in potassium sulfate there. It is three as a coefficient, then two as a subscript. That means that I have six of them. And then the oxygen gets a little tricky because you have three times four on the reactant side. But then look at the product side. You have three sulfates that each have four oxygens. That's also three times four. So this particular equation is balanced. This is just practicing counting elements. Yeah. What's that? You don't have to. Sometimes you can leave the polyatomic ions together. Only if the polyatomic ions stay together. You can just count how many polyatomic ions I have. Yes. What's that? Um, when we're doing compounds, we don't necessarily need to worry about. All of these are compounds. So we don't necessarily need to worry about the charges yet. There will be situations where you're talking about ions. If there's ions involved, which won't be in this unit, then you would have to consider the charges. Okay, let's practice counting one more time. This is a situation where we have to be careful about the chlorines because we have chlorine in more than one compound. So on the reactant side, we have four hydrochloric acids. So I have four chlorines on the reactants. And on the product side, I have two chlorines in manganese chloride. And then I have a chlorine molecule. So that's two plus two or four. So this is also balanced. Let's try to balance one together. Now, remember I said we're going to start with the trickiest compound. So in this case, ammonium sulfate is the trickiest compound. This is a situation where the polyatomic ion does not stay together. The polyatomic ion ammonium does not stay together. Sulfate does. So if you wanted to, and we will learn that strategy. I have a video already posted. If you wanted to watch the strategy on leaving the polyatomic ions together, you can do that. So let's talk about before. Now, when you're doing these, you don't have to have two charts, T-charts. 
you can just cross out the befores when you change them to the afters. So beforehand, I'm just going to count how many elements we have. See if you get the same numbers. So remember, our two strategies are going to be start with the biggest, most complex compound and then leave hydrogen and oxygen for last. So the first thing I'm going to do is put a 2 in front of NH3. That changes the number of nitrogens on the product side to 2, so nitrogens are balanced. Sulfur is already balanced. So next I'm going to balance sodium. So I'll put a 2 in front of NaOH. Now my sodiums are balanced. So now everything is balanced except for hydrogen and oxygen. Now it's time to address hydrogen and oxygen. The reason we do this is because a lot of times they fall into place. So right now, as we speak, on the reactant side, we have 10 hydrogens. So that means I'm going to have to put a 2 in front of water to get 10 hydrogens. That's where the oxygen falls into place. I'm going to tell you this right now, unless you're dealing with balancing um, organic compounds, which is carbon and hydrogen compounds or hydrocarbons, combustion of hydrocarbons, you're going to end up with some big coefficients. But if you start getting into coefficients where you've got like, oh, I've got 10, 12, 14, 13, you got to say to yourself, I must have gone off track because the numbers are not going to end up being that big. Another thing we can do is balance by inspection. So the largest compound is aluminum oxide. So I'm just going to put a 2 in front of aluminum on the reactant side. So in this case, I'm going to say I don't think I necessarily need to do a T-chart for this one. This one looks straightforward enough. So I'm going to balance aluminum. Next, I'll balance oxygen. So aluminum, oxygen are balanced. The only thing left to do is put a three. So you can see that I didn't necessarily need to do a T-chart for this one. I thought it was going to fall into place pretty easily. Okay, so this is our introduction to balancing equations. We will continue on tomorrow, but for the rest of today, you have the time to practice balancing.